occasion we will examine how a monopoly engages in profit maximisation and we will compare this with the outcome under perfect competition. A monopoly is a sole supplier of a product to the market and so faces the market demand curve. Monopolies may arise for a variety of reasons. It might be that a firm has been given the legal right to be the sole seller of a product or service or they may have achieved a technological advantage over a rival. For example, they may have developed and patented a wonder drug. The advantage of monopoly may be temporary or it may be more long term, but such market power allows monopolists to be price makers rather than price takers. If there was considerable competition in the supply of the good, then a firm would not have such control over price. With monopoly, there is the chance to maximise profit and earn profit that is above that available when there is perfect competition. That is, monopolists can earn economic profit, mostly called abnormal or supernormal profit. We will illustrate using a simple example. In this example, we will examine the demand and supply of potatoes on an island community. We will assume that the local council has awarded a single license to trade in potatoes to a company called Spuds R Us. Moreover, we will assume that any seller on a neighbouring island would find it prohibitively expensive to transport and sell potatoes direct to consumers. In other words, Spuds R Us has a monopoly in the supply of potatoes. We will illustrate the case using simple numbers that obey the basic laws of demand and supply. Later, we will compare this monopoly situation with that of perfect competition. That is, where the island government takes away the monopoly rights of Spuds R Us and allows competition to prevail. In the table, we have the elements of a demand curve faced by Spuds R Us. The price and quantity columns reflect the basic law of demand. At a price of £6, there is a zero quantity of potatoes demanded per week. As price falls to £5, the quantity demanded increases to 100 kg per week. At a price of £4, quantity demanded is 200 kg, and so on, until at a price of zero, that is giving it away, the maximum quantity demanded is 600 kg. Total revenue, which is the price times quantity demanded, increases up to a quantity of 300 kg and then falls away because of the nature of our demand curve. Sometimes we refer to price as average revenue, that is the revenue obtained from a unit sold. The slide before you depicts the values in the previous table. Graph B, the bottom graph, shows the demand curve, displaying the relationship between price and quantity. Thus, where the price of potatoes was £6 per kilogram, the quantity demanded was zero. We are by the red D in the top left portion of graph B. And when the price was zero, the maximum quantity demanded was 600 kilograms. We are by the AR, average revenue, equals demand in the bottom right portion of graph B. There were other points on the demand curves too. We have shown the point where price equals £3 and quantity equals 300 kilograms. This and other points on the de demand curve translate directly onto the total revenue function shown in graph A, the graph in the top part of the slide. When price equals £3 and quantity equals 300 kilograms, total revenue equals £900. You should also note that the quantities of 0 and 6 on the total, graph, total revenue graph translate onto the demand graph. The total revenue curve has a dome shape reflecting the fact that as price falls and quantity rises, total revenue increases at first, in our case until we reach 300 kilograms, and then falls. We have drawn a perfect dome shape here on the assumption that we could divide the price and quantity categories into infinitely small numbers. For example, when price equals £5.99, quantity demanded equals 1 kilogram, and when price is £5.98, quantity demanded equals 2 kilograms, and so on. This, of course, does not match our table exactly, but you should see the logic of the argument used. It also helps to make the diagrammatic explanation simpler as we go. 
In order to understand profit maximization, we also need to know what is meant by cost and profit. In economics, at cost refers to opportunity cost. That is the cost of a foregone alternative in using an input. Thus we note the cost of labour and materials as rewards to their use in creating a particular good or service rather than being used in their next best activity. Likewise, it is important to recognise that the owner of a business, an entrepreneur, requires a return to keep them in that business, and we know this as normal profit. However, in economics there are two sorts of profit. We will deal firstly with normal profit. In our example, the next best alternative activity for the owner of Spudzorus may, may have been labouring, for which he could get a wage of £10,000 per annum. If so, then he would need to obtain a minimum, minimum of £10,000 per annum from the potato trade in order to keep being a potato seller. He would also require some compensation for the risk he undertakes in running this business. In a similar way, shareholders are rewarded through dividends because they invest in a particular company rather than putting their money in the next best alternative use, for example in a high yield savings account. Dividends reflect the opportunity cost of an investment opportunity plus the risk premium. Normal profit is thus a reward to entrepreneurs or savers for undertaking a business opportunity in a competitive environment. It is a charge on the business and so reflects the costs that we will draw. If there is a lot of competition, perfect competition for potatoes, then firms like Spuds RS will be restricted in the prices that they can charge because customers will switch to lower cost suppliers. Competition keeps prices down to reflect costs and so firms can only earn a normal profit over the long run. However, if firms have some market power, and in the case of Spuds or Us, they have total market power because of monopoly status, firms can charge prices above competitive levels. They can thus earn supernormal sometimes called abnormal or economic profit. Costs then reflect the opportunity cost of supplying a service. In this example the cost of supplying one extra kilogram of potatoes per week is two pounds. So the total cost of supplying zero units is zero, the total cost of supplying 100 kilograms of potatoes per week is 200 pounds, the total cost of supplying 200 kilograms of potatoes per week is £400, and so on. The marginal cost, that is the change in the total cost of supplying an extra unit, is also £2 per kilogram. Technically, we should depict a change in the cost from one unit of output to another on the table, between the units of output, and this is done in the table before you. Likewise, this means that the average or unit cost, which is the total cost divided by output, Q, is always £2 per kilogram. We can also show the cost curves graphically. In the diagram before you, we have assumed a linear total cost function, and as we've assumed that there are no fixed costs, the total cost curve begins at zero. This is purely to make the diagram simpler. The total cost curve, TC, in graph A, consists only of variable costs. In our example, as production gets underway, costs will rise in a constant proportion, £2 per unit. So when Q is equal to 100 kilograms, total cost is £200. For Q equals 200 kilograms, total cost is £400, and so on. This means that the marginal cost, that is the change in total cost resulting from a very small change in output, is constant at £2. In other words, the slope of the total cost curve in graph A is constant. The constancy of this slope is illustrated on graph B. As the total cost curve is linear and there are no fixed costs, the average cost of production, that is total cost divided by the quantity produced, is the same as the marginal cost in our example, that is marginal cost equals average cost. Remember, normal profit belongs to the cost function in economics and is thus represented in this diagram. Like wages and payments for raw materials, normal profit is a charge on the business. It's the opportunity cost of the entrepreneur plus a risk premium. Now we can show how abnormal profit might arise by putting together the information we have on revenue and costs. Total profit 
is the difference between total revenue and total cost. In this example, profit is maximised at a quantity of 200 kilograms of potatoes, and at this output, profit is 400 pounds. We can also show profit maximisation as a situation in which marginal revenue equals marginal cost, MC. MR, marginal revenue, represents the additions to revenue that come about from selling one more unit, while marginal cost, as we've already seen, is the addition to cost of producing that unit. As with marginal cost, we show marginal revenue as points between the quantity interval because they represent changes from one point to another. MR declines as we sell more. However, the key point is between Q is 150 equal to 150 kilograms, where marginal revenue equals three pounds, and Q equals 250 kilograms, where marginal revenue equals one pound. By deduction, at Q is equal to 200 kilograms of potatoes, marginal revenue equals two pounds. And when we put this together with marginal cost, which is also equal to two pounds, we can see that this too shows that profits are maximized, where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, Q is equal to 200 kilograms, and at this point the price per unit is four pounds while the average cost AC is two pounds. As 200 kilograms are bought and sold, total profit is 400 pounds. We have put these values for marginal revenue onto the diagram. There are three relevant values where Q is equal to 100 kilograms, marginal revenue equals four pounds, when Q is equal to 200 kilograms, marginal revenue equals two pounds, and when Q is equal to 300 kilograms, marginal revenue equals zero. However, we could have also explained the additions to total revenue from selling an extra unit, or marginal revenue, by a series of tangents on the total revenue curve in graph A. At a quantity of 100 kilograms sold, the slope of tangent A is much steeper than tangent C or tangent B. Thus, the value of the tangent A at 100 kilograms, the marginal revenue at 100 kilograms, is equal to four pounds. At 300 kilograms sold, the slope of tangent B is zero, and so marginal revenue equals zero. Tangent C is an intermediate position. The value of tangent C, or marginal revenue at 200 kilograms, is two pounds. So, the slope of the total revenue curve depicts marginal revenue. We also need to add the total marginal and average cost curves in order to show profit maximization. In graph A, we show the point where the distance between total revenue and total cost is greatest. This is the distance TU. This is at two units. Here we can see that profit is 800 pounds, that's total revenue, minus 400 pounds, total cost, and so it's equal to 400 pounds. Profit is 400 pounds. Note that tangent C, i.e. the slope of the total revenue curve at 200 kilograms, has the same slope as the total cost curve at this point, indicating that marginal revenue equals marginal cost at 200 kilograms. This point is shown in the lower diagram at V. Further, at a quantity of 200 kilograms bought and sold, the average cost or cost per unit is two pound, or the price per unit is four pounds. Total abnormal profit is 400 pounds, and this is shown by the blue shaded area. How does profit maximization under monopoly compare with profit maximization under perfect competition? Perfect competition is a situation where there are a large number of sellers who can freely enter and exit the market and who will offer identical products to many buyers who have perfect information. Well, under perfect competition, firms can only earn a normal profit. Identifying normal profit on a diagram does cause consternation for some students because it occurs where the total revenue equates with the total cost curve, a point illustrated in graph A before you at point Y and mirrored in graph B at the point where marginal costs equates with the demand curve, or price if you will, and is illustrated at point Z. How can this be? I hear many of you share. But remember what we said earlier, that economists include normal profit in the total cost function. So firms operating under perfectly competitive conditions are making a normal profit. 
They are also maximising their profit from the competitive conditions they find themselves in, because these firms are price takers and cannot influence demand. Thus the market price is their marginal revenue, and they are equating this with their marginal cost to maximise their profits. In this case it means that the market clear clearing output is 400 kilograms of potatoes, and the market clearing price is £2. When we compare perfect competition with pure monopoly, we see that output is lower under pure monopoly and the price is higher. The equilibrium under competition is a price of £2 and a quantity of 400 kilograms. Under mon monopoly, profits are maximised at an output of 200 kilograms and at that output, the demand curve shows that people are willing to f pay £4 a kilogram. You might note that in our diagram, because of the assumptions about cost and demand, the output under monopoly is half that under perfect competition. Under monopoly, consumers are perceived as worse off with higher prices and lower quantities. But why won't monopolists charge lower prices, say £2 a kilogram, and sell more, say 400 kilograms? The potato seller could charge prices that were in line with normal profits, Remember, these were the profits that would keep this person selling potatoes rather than go back to their next best occupation, in our case labouring. And that would mean charging a price of £2 a kilogram. However, such an act of altruism would be seen as irrational here. In economics we assume that people prefer more to less. The potato seller could earn more profit for a lower output and hence a lower total cost if they set price equal to £4, rather than at the, set it at the perfectly competitive price of £2. This opportunity only arises because the potato seller has the monopoly power granted by the island government. The story of the island potato seller raises an important question about the nature of income distribution associated with monopoly and the allocation of resources. Should the potato seller be allowed to exploit their market power on this island and earn abnormal profits at the expense of customers, particularly as they are not selling a very sophisticated set of products? Clearly, the community through the island government could regulate the pricing behaviour of the potato seller, or they could facilitate an easing of the planning laws to allow someone else on the island to sell potatoes and so promote competition. This would then push prices down to competitive levels, that is, we would get a situation where prices would equate with marginal costs, just as we would under perfect competition. In the potato seller story, monopoly and the existence of profit is seen to have negative consequences for the island society. However, if the firm concerned had produced a wonder drug that cured the world of AIDS, should we be so harsh to judge monopoly profit? Society protects invest inventors by the use of the patent system. Protection of intellectual property rights cuts down on copying and provides an incentive to invent things such as wonder drugs. In such instances, monopoly profits should be allowed, and although it will lead to lower quantities being available initially, it will attract other pharmaceutical companies to create their own patent protected products of this wonder drug. Indeed, the dynamic associated with a technologically driven monopoly may provide benefits greater than that associated with the textbook world of perfect competition.